Okay, this lecture is on sex, attraction, mate, selection, and jealousy. Now granted, I know that you have a lecture here about sex right after a lecture about fear. Uh, that was coincidental. So let's uh, talk about sex. Well, we're going to talk about some aspects of sexual attraction and a little bit about the relationship to motivation. Well, one could have an entire course, one does have an entire course on love and sex and sexual attraction and motivation from the neuroscience of it and the hormones of it and social and behavioral. It's a very complex topic. It completely consumes our lives sometimes. We will only t dedicate this one lecture and we're going to hit upon a few things, a sexual attraction, sexual selection, which has a lot of biological relevance, and some male and female differences when it comes to things like jealousy and infidelity. So sexual attraction, well, this is a very subjective. It can be different between cultures. It can be different between time periods. Uh, one way to address sexual attraction uh, across time is to look at, for example, art because people have been painting for a long time and they paint attractive things or as they see what is attractive. So if you look at the Renaissance, for example, sexually attractive women were painted with a more uh, voluptuous form, a larger form. So these are some of those paintings. But even maybe 60, 70 years ago, even sex symbols were uh, more voluptuous, a little bit larger than they are today. Today, a lot of sex symbols can be extremely skinny. This is mostly in the United States. We're talking about uh, sexual attraction in the United States. But even this really skinny, these skinny models, well, this isn't really the, the complete picture because it's not always uh, absolute skinny models that are portrayed as being attractive. Well, if we look at Victorian England, they will highlight pale skin, for example, because it represents wealth, because people with pale skin didn't have to work outside. Outside, you get a tan. Indoors, you have so much money, you don't need to be outdoors, and so your skin gets paler, and so people would artificially make their skin pale as a symbol of wealth but also a symbol of attraction and maybe today it's you have so much free time you have so much wealth and free time you can exercise and be outside and get tan and so people now go to tanning booths or have spray on tan or you know a lot of models are represented as having tan because in a lot of ways of what it represents which is the ability to have leisure when we look at sexual attraction, it can be very different across cultures, and this is where anthropology takes a, a very interesting look. Body form, um, body uh, augmentation, and manipulation can be very different. Here are just a few examples of physical beauty as represented by different cultures around the world. Here's the Wadabi of Africa, and the, the men um, dress up in very bright clothes with very bright facial facial makeup and they do these ex exaggerated grins while they're dancing this is the attraction what about the giraffe women of northern Thailand they're adding these um, individual rings as they get older to extend their neck now they might be looking like they're making their neck longer and longer but actually these rings push the shoulders down and actually manipulate the clavicle and some of the other bones around the shoulder but this is what's attractive this is looks like very very long necks well that's what's attractive in that environment we see a lot of differences about how people change and we might look at some of these things and say, wow, that is just really odd. What a weird thing to do to your nose, to your lip, to your neck. How strange. You know, the foot binding in China. These are these tiny little shoes and they would literally bind their feet to the point where it would break bones. This, is, this seems very barbaric. 
But then we can look at westernized societies and we look at what's physical, physically attractive and we see some also rather bizarre behavior. What is the physically attractive in our country and what lengths do we go to to become physically attractive to others? Now we're not extending our necks or putting bones in our nose, or are we? For example, extreme thin. You know, that might be very unappealing in, in another culture. I mean, these people need to eat themselves a sandwich. Come on. What about high heels? This is a very strange thing. I know women like high heels or men like high, women in high heels. Um, there's some ideas and some theories of why women wear high heels to make them more vulnerable as they walk, blah, blah. But if you look at an x-ray, you can see what it manipulates the bones. The bones aren't meant to do this. I have to admit, one of the things that attracted me to my wife when I first met her is she was wearing comfortable tennis shoes. And I'm like, well, there's a sensible person. What about plastic surgery? What about the exaggeration or reduction of body parts with surgery? This is an extremely big business. I mean, if, if you just look at comparing 1997 and 2008, this is the best I could find, look at the difference in numbers in breast augmentation, liposuction, rhinoplasty, nose jobs, you know, the injection of collagen to expand the lips. So we could look back at the giraffe women of Thailand and we could look at fo foot binding and say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Why would people do that? But look at the length that people go. And, and females aren't the only one. You know, in fact, statistically, the greatest rise in demographics of plastic surgery is for men. So m men get hair plugs, they get surgery on their scalp. A lot of them get Botox. Damn, I look good. I had Botox. You know, Botox is a really interesting thing, too, just uh, on the surface, because Botox is actually a derivative from botulinum, which is a poison, deadly poison. And it is an acetylcholine antagonist. It stops acetylcholine from working or being released, which affects muscle contraction. And so botulinum is very poisonous because it stops maybe uh, your heart from working or your diaphragm from working, well if this is injected it stops the muscles from contracting and the muscles um, relax and you look, I guess, you look like you're a little uh, younger because you don't have the wrinkles. Of course you don't have facial expressions either, it seems rather odd. Pec implants, look at these guys getting themselves pec implants. That's a little weird. I thought that was weird until I found calf implants which is actually a growing thing. So people go and get their calves extended. Now, I'm not sure why they do this, um, unless they're attractive to somebody else while walking away. I, I don't know. It, odd. Odd things. What about tattooing? You know, tattooing we find in many, many different cultures. They're oftentimes presented as enhancing beauty or enhancing uh, things like risk perception, which we'll get to later. And I found some statistics from this uh, Harris poll that was done and of 2016 people. It was done in 2012. And we can see this percentage of people with tattoos kind of dipped, but it's really on the rise. This is 2012, so it probably continued to go uh, up. And I think it's, it's a so much more common thing. Um, I think when I was a little kid, if people had tattoos, they were in the Navy, in the Army, or, was there, or they were bikers. Now you see it with a lot of people. In fact, the biggest demographic is female. That's the growing, that's the growing demographic. So in 2003, more males than females. In 2008, more males than females had tattoos. But if you look in 2012, females have bypassed, have gone past males in terms of the percentage with tattoos. So let's talk about sexual selection. Sexual selection is talked about in human psychology. It's talked about in animals and animal behavior. Um, and these are a bunch of different examples of how uh, males and females select each other. Some of her, you know, bird songs, and sometimes it's fighting with deer. Sometimes it's showy feathers. Here is a extinct 
an extinct animal. This is an uh, Irish moose. It's got these giant, giant horns that it grows only once a year. Um, and uh, that's a lot of energy put into that. So sexual selection is the theory that competition for mates between individuals of the same sex result in differential mating and reproduction. In other words, males compete against males for females, females compete against females for males. It kind of differs depending on the uh, animal. So if you remember back to that talking about the selfish gene, that Richard Dawkins book, the idea that the selective unit of evolution is the gene. If a gene for behavior or appearance is helpful in replicating itself by increasing the animal's probability of producing offspring, the gene's frequency will increase. So if we back up and we look at these things, here are, here are some uh, mountain sheep that butt heads against each other, but if that works, if the winner, if that aggression works, that gene for that aggression will continue. We talked about these feathers. We talked about uh, uh, you know these very exaggerated stimuli. So this mechanism can drive evolution, can change and modify, because certain traits are more valuable. These traits can be amplified, and with a species, one sex almost always females, acts as, a limiting re acts as a limiting resource for the other. In other words, the female uh, oftentimes has to, we're talking about a lot of different animals here, uh, sp spend more energy in reproduction, in, in the act of reproduction, in the act of, of raising uh, an offspring, in the act of keeping in, with that offspring. Oftentimes males leave, although that's not always the case. Males are all oftentimes, especially in birds, the brighter ones, the ones with the, the, the more fancy dance, the ones with the brighter plumage. I mean, look at this male bird dancing. This is amazing. This is a bird of paradise mating dance. It gets very complex. Look at the plumage on this male attracting the female. Okay. Bird dancing is really common, especially uh, in these uh, birds of paradise. It's just really beautiful. Now that's a talented bird right there. That's one of my favorites. This is all the showy behavior. This is all the showy plumage. These dan the genes that go into these behaviors, the genes that create these plumages, these are passed on because the animal is more successful. What about long-term mate selection? This is the difference between males and females on what they might be looking for for long-term mates. It depends on the mating strategy, it depends on whether they're monogamous, um, whether the male is involved. Uh, and oftentimes what people or humans talk about as being favorable or things they look for in long-term mates can be very different than what they look for in a quick sexual partner, sexual partners that don't, uh, don't lead to a long-term mate. And when we talk about uh, differences, we oftentimes look at things like fitness and fecundity. I like that word fecundity, it's kind of an interesting sounding word, but it really, these uh, words mean what is the success of the reproduction of that individual and it's not just total number of offsprings like the male how many offsprings did they produce it's how well those uh, offspring survive reach sexual maturity and reproduce themselves that is a measure of fitness and fecundity not just raw numbers and we'll keep that in mind Males, for example, have the potential to produce more offspring in a given time period than females. They can breed a lot. Sperm are very inexpensive biologically. Females put a lot more energy and time into not only producing eggs, but producing um, and keeping offspring, especially uh, mammals. These are the sex cell difference idea. Males produce many millions times more sex cell sperm than females. Does that a notion influence 
the, uh, the male's behavior, male's preferences, and of course the fitness and fecundity of that individual. So long-term mate selection, evolutionary differences between males and females again, energy and time commitment. This is getting back to females, again, especially males, have to take care of their young. They have to spend time with the young inside them and then the young uh, come to the world rather uh, fragile, uh, especially humans. Females are required to put greater energy and greater risk to themselves in protecting the young and producing the offspring. Does that influence um, mate selection? Does that influence um, perception of attraction? So let's look at a few mating strategies. Well, monogamy, one mating pair at a time, male and female mate. Many birds do this, male and female. We have a lot of birds around Fresno State, and these are blackbirds, little blackbirds, and they're kind of a little bit shiny. These are starlings. These are birds are called starlings. And the males have a little bit more shine to their coat, but if you see one, you'll see another. They bond. So if you see one eating some food, look around, you'll find the other. When one leaves, the other one will leave. These are oftentimes monogamous animals. You can have a serial monogamy, which is just one mate at a time, but that those mates might change over time. And then there's others, the poly, many, mono, one, poly, many, polygamy, more than one spouse at a time. In humans, this is actually the most common mating strategy by cultures and by history. Um, so there are more, in, in a polygony, more than one wife throughout human history and in total number of cultures in the world, 83% practice some form of polygony. Even though probably more people total are monogamous, more cultures or, or communities are po polygonous. And then there's polyandry, more than one uh, husband. I don't know, sexually speaking, this makes maybe a little bit more sense um, than, than polygony, but male uh, males can uh, oftentimes are, are larger and, and control uh, aspects of the, the, um, the mating strategy in that community. At least they have historically, not so much today. So now we get into long-term mate strategies playing off on these ideas of these different, um, well, uh, sexual reproductions, um, amount of time commitment, uh, sex cells, fecundity. Uh, so here's some of the stereotypes. Um, males focus on youth and health. We look at uh, uh, things like, you know, symmetry of females stuff like that. There's all these studies. Young, attractive, healthy, be able to, and this goes back to that stereotype. Males look for females that are successful and healthy and can care for young. The offspring will also be attractive, in this case because of the genes, increasing the probability of them passing on their genes. That's the fecundity. Females prefer stability, wanting that individual to stay around and help. The wealth to, to provide resources for, the, for her and the young. Stability implies that the male will be responsible in, in, in caring. Um, wealth implies providing resources. So let's look at a few studies that um, investigate this. Weiderman looked at a thousand personal ads to see how male and female advertise themselves. This study came out in Ethology and Social Bi Sociobiology, and men are more likely to offer financial security when advertising themselves in a personal ad. Not as often, I'm young and good looking and athletic, I have security. Females advertise themselves more often as young and attractive. This was found in many different cultures by Buss. Buss is a very famous uh, researcher looking at these mate selection differences. Look at the rating of value of traits in terms of sexual preference, but he did it across the world. 
These are those universal motives that we talked about for sexual attraction, which supports, in a way, these evolutionary influences that I talked about a few slides ago. And it was like with the experiments with the ads, women rated good financial prospect as being very high, um, and men rated looks as being higher. So here, here's some results from uh, Buss's 89 study. If we look at financial security, we can see that rated higher in females, um, especially here in Japan. Males rated that high, but not as high. A little higher in India. Ambition, females rated that as high. You can see Germany's kind of uh, equated out here, but these others are high. Ambition implies more financial resources in the future. Um, I remember when, when my wife and I were first dating, I always asked her because I was very poor. I had this very old, rusty car that barely worked, and I didn't have any money at all. And I said, you know, when you first met me, you know, I didn't have, because she's an anthropologist, she knows all these studies. I said, I didn't have any of these resources. And she said, yeah, but you were, you were working on your PhD, you had ambition, so the future was looking good. Okay, I took that. And then down here we have looks, higher rated in males, a little less so in females. Now when rating their top four um, highest ranking attributes of a long-term mate, there's actually a lot of similarities between males and females. Mutual attract attraction and love, dependable character, dependability, emotional stabi stability and maturity, pleasing disposition, nobody wants a long-term mate who's a jerk. These are all rated very, very high by both males and females. But when you get into some other ones, as a ranking, males ranked it higher than females in good looks and a similar education that was high, higher in males than females, we start seeing some of these kinds of differences. But here's a question when we deal with these ideas, these stereotypes. Let's look at these stereotypes in a modern society. Males reproduce, reproduce a lot and, and go away and don't help. Females uh, being very, very selective, that kind of thing. But should men want the most children as possible? No, that's not true. Is this genetically the best way for males to ensure the genes are passed on? Not just total number of offspring, but total number of successful offspring that produce more offspring. We get into that fecundity idea. The more children, the less likely each one will have enough resources to survive and the harder to, pro to provide for each one. So um, realistically, just a lot of offspring isn't a good way, and especially if the male isn't there to support the raising of those children, especially human, human offspring because they're so fragile for so long. So, and it also depends a little bit on the time when humans lived. Let's look at a few. So until about 10,000 years ago, most societies of humans were hunters and gatherers. In other words, they moved from place to place to hunt. They didn't stay in one place and grow things or raise animals, they moved. Now when you move, you don't carry a lot. You don't have a lot of things to carry. You don't own possessions. So owning possessions isn't a good thing because you gotta move those things. And having a lot of children, it's very difficult to move them and to take care of them and so low family size was best. So we had a real low number of humans on the earth for a very long time. And then about 10,000 years ago, we have this shifting in human society to what is known as agrarian, agriculture, agrarian. And this is where you stay in one place and you farm land and you raise animals. Well, now you can own possessions and your sign of wealth is possessions. You also want to have a lot of children. The more children you have, the more children you have to work the fields, to increase your land and increase the ability to take care of your land, and large families were a sign of wealth. And this is where we start seeing a real increase in, in population size of human beings. 
But what about modern humans? Two working parents, expenses of providing for a large family, children are freaking expensive. They are really expensive. They, you have, we have limited resources and they take a lot of them. It's more reasonable to desire smaller families in modern societies that are more economically developed. And with modern medicine, people don't have, uh, do not need to have many children to ensure that they pass on their genes. For example, in a society, uh, let's take the example of Mozambique. Well, they have uh, <coughs> a situation where they might have seven or eight children per woman. That's a fertility rate. But because they children get diseases and they don't have modern infrastructure for a very long time um, only about two would survive so you'd have stability of population growth but what happens is in about as of about a hundred years ago we just started in many societies to allow our children to survive modern medicine mod modern care and so as children survived there was less pressure to have more and more and so the total fertility rate in more economically developed countries began to dec decline decline and what we are now in places uh, like China for example in the 1970 1979 they implemented a one child policy because before that in the early part of the 1970s late 60s you know the total fertility rate was five or six but they were surviving, the children were surviving. It's a wonderful thing, but you see this exponential growth of people in China. And they were lim they have limited resources, so they implemented a policy. So what we see is as soon as children are able to survive, people want to have couples, want to have two or three children, and they want to use their resources to care for those children and for other things. So you see this decline. What's happened, however, is an over contraction of the number of children in places like China, um, I mean, places like Japan, where they have a total fertility rate of 1.3. They're shrinking. But that's not only in Japan. It's in Italy and Germany and England and uh, Iceland. These are all places that are showing this really big contraction and the population is getting smaller and smaller. I know that we look at the population of the world and the population of the world is about 7.3 um, billion people. Uh, and it's been growing exponentially. There was maybe 3 billion people in the 1970s. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that that's leveling off, that a lot of places are really encouraging reproduction. So it really depends on the circumstance. So one important aspect of reproduction is to increase the probability that your offspring will survive. So one way of doing this is to increase genetic diversity. There was this misguided, these misguided people who talk about uh, the purity of race, keeping the purity of the white race or the Aryan race or whatever. That's not good survival strategy overall. They're also idiots, but um, you look at um, really trying to increase the diversity, genetic diversity, especially when it comes to things like immune system. I have a certain immune system. I might be less susceptible to some diseases. My wife might be less susceptible to other diseases. We bring our genes together, we have children, and they increase the number of diseases that they're resistant to. That's that variability, that, that increased variation in genes. But how do you know? How do you know the genetic diversity of the people you're dating? Well, one way is smell. You may have heard of this experiment before. Let's take a look. We talk about pheromones, we talk about this. We're not really good at using our, our olfactory for smelling things. Our head is too far above the ground. That's where all the smells are. Rats and dogs are much better, but we still have an olfactory system and it's sensitive to things. So here's the experiment. Men wore t-shirts for a couple days. They got their stinkiness on them. They placed the t-shirts in plastic bags. These were frozen. And then women, once they thought out, women smelled and rated the appeal of the smell. That's right. Pe women went through and smelled a bunch of t-shirts. 
and then blood was tested from the males and females. Women prefer shirts with a medium match of the human leukocyte antigen gene, HLA gene. That's a gene that has to do with the immune system. And like those who match the woman's father. So they want a lot of diversity. They want differences. They want differences, but they also want a little bit that is of somebody that has pr proven their success in reproduction, and that's their father. They like diversity, but also like proof. So the results were also true if men swelled, uh, smelled women's t-shirts. It's also experiment was true with people who are um, gay and lesbian, of who they prefer. It's kind of weird to think that our choices of long-term um, partner depends on how they smell. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe somebody looks great on paper. You're dating somebody that look great, okay? We have so much in common. We come from the same families, but there is something. Something not right there. Some smell that you just can't put your finger on. And what else is kind of odd is sometimes when people first go out on the dates, the male and the female hide these odors by splashing on these um, colognes, these horrible eye-tearing colognes, and you can't smell those other things. So you might not know until three dates in that you are genetically similar to the person you're dating. And then you're like, something, something's not right. What about risk and risk takers? Are those attractive? Um, we do a lot of risk taking. Seem to be very popular. This guy is sitting on a big bull and he's riding a big bull. This guy's flying on a motorcycle. Those are some risk taking. Bungee jumping. That's what I did. That's how I worked my way through college as I, for three years in a row, toured around Canada selling bungee jumping to people and performing bungee jumping shows and high diving shows. Yeah, I missed that. So here's a few experiments. In this experiment by Bassett and Moss, they presented 87 men and 219 women personality profiles of possible romantic partners. The personality profiles differed on the level of risk taking. There are high risk takers, medium risk takers, and low risk takers. The participants were asked to rate the desirability of the people in the profile. Um, would you like to have coffee with them? Would you want to have a date with them? Short term relationship, long term relationship? all by reading how risky they were. The results were as follows. Men and women prefer high risk takers as friends and short-term romantic uh, partners. Only women actually preferred risk takers as long-term romantic partners. Think about that. Do you like risk takers? So here are some of the results. Low risk takers, desirability, not so high. Okay, uh, maybe I'll be friends with them. They're not get into that friend zone. Look over here, high risk people. They want to be friends with those. They want to have coffee with them. They even show a little bit of heightened, uh, heightened uh, a, a short term relationship, long term relationships, even marriage. I want to marry myself a bungee jumper. Uh, so back to my wife again. The first time I met my wife, we were teaching at a community college in Hawaii. And I was teaching biology and psychology, and she was teaching anthropology, and we had never met. And there was this big grass area in front of our offices, where offices were in the same building. And I walk out one day, and I see her folding up a skydiving parachute. It's the first thing I remember, and I thought, oh yeah, there's somebody I want to get to know. What she would do is she would teach her classes in the morning, drive to the other side of the island on Oahu, do a skydive, drive back to teach her night class, and fold up her parachute in between. I actually took parachute uh, skydiving lessons with her for a long time. She had a lot more jumps than I did. I think I had, I ended up with 20 before we had to settle down. What about jealousy? Females know their paternity. They know that the offspring is theirs. Males are always less sure. Now granted there are genetic tests, but you can be a stable relationship, but you never know for sure. Hence, men are more worried about sexual infidelity, but females might be more concerned with um, security. Males provide resources, so females are more jealous about emotional infidelity. And here's an experiment by Bunk in 1996. 
report more distress to sexual infidelity. Males are much more concerned about sexual infidelity, not to say females are not concerned about that, but much more distressed than females. And females would be more concerned about a male getting emotionally attached to somebody else because that could increase the likelihood that they'd leave. Here's another experiment by Harris and Crisfeld, 1996, and it looked at percent more bothered. How much are you bothered? Percent more bothered. And this is males in green over here, and this is sex. Infidelity, sex, really high. Females, not nearly as high. What about love? Infidelity, falling in love with somebody. What if somebody, the, 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 the man never, uh, never has a sexual relationship, but is um, doing a lot of Facebooking and doing a lot of inappropriate texting and those kinds of you know, increased emotional bonding? Women really don't like that. Men are less concerned about that. The eye, you know, and so it kind of goes back to the, our high hardwired genetics of concerned about passing on our genes and having uncertainty therein, and female with the resources. And that's the end.